So usually, when I get a chance to give a message, I start out with a story about my family, or I start out with a movie quote, some sort of lighthearted way to be able to start out the lesson and be able to kind of convey the overall message of the lesson. But today I want to start out a little bit different. Today I want to talk about this picture. Now, I took this picture on June 6th, 2014. It's a little bit blurry because I was in such a hurry to take my phone out of my pocket and snap the picture that was happening because I was so moved by what was going on. So back then I was attending another church and I, uh, they, they had a Saturday night service and a Sunday morning service. And because I lived so close to that church, I would often attend both services. And when the Saturday night service was introduced, it was introduced as it would be something different. The lights would be down lower. The music would be louder. It would be unlike a church service that you would find on Sunday morning. So we could tell our friends, hey, if you're uncomfortable going to a church on Sunday morning, come check this out and it'll be different. The first Saturday that they had the service, it did exactly as it was designed to do. There were people that I had never seen in church Sunday morning, and they were showing up to hear the good news of the gospel. So a few weeks later, I noticed that more and more people were coming. And about a month after that, that's when this picture happened. So I showed up to church a little bit early, talked with the people that I know, and when I'm talking with them, a bus pulls up to the front. And slowly, about 15 special needs adults get off the bus and work their way into the church. These people were warmly greeted. They were shown to where the cookies were in the foyer and then shown to where the auditorium was. As these people were walk walking their way in, I found a seat that I could enjoy service at. So I'm waiting, and just before service started, two special needs gentlemen sat in the row right in front of me. I'd like to tell you that I leaned forward, introduced myself, shook their hand, and talked with them a little bit. I'd really like to tell you that. But I'm embarrassed to say I just sat there. And if I'm being honest, I just sat there because I was a little uncomfortable. I don't have any experience with special needs people. I wasn't sure how to act. I wasn't sure what to do. And so I just sat there. And the worship band came up and they're starting to play their music and, and I'm just sitting there. And, you know, again, if I'm being honest, I was starting to look around to see, okay, who has seen me here and would they notice if I snuck out of the back of the church? Would they question me about it tomorrow morning when I showed up at church? Hey, why'd you leave? What, what's going on? So the band's playing, and that's when this picture happened. The gentleman on the left in the wheelchair, he attempted to lift his arms in praise to his Lord and Savior. And whatever his disability is, it didn't allow him to raise his arms up. So he was struggling, trying his best just to lift his arms in praise to his one Lord and Savior. The gentleman beside him, an able-bodied special needs person, saw what was going on and without, without a second thought, reached over, grabbed his arm, and lifted it up for him. Amen. While I was in a church service thinking about myself and how uncomfortable I was, these two gentlemen were worshiping God in the only way they knew how. And when it wasn't possible, the other one helped his buddy to be able to do that. It was like a heart shot. I could almost hear God saying directly to me, how dare you? How dare you think that you're so much better than these people? They showed up here to worship me and you're here worried about yourself. It was a moment I will never forget for the rest of my life. Maybe some of you know how I felt. Have you ever walked in a church service Maybe you've been sitting in the middle of the service and you find 
your focus isn't on Jesus. Maybe somebody new sat a little bit too close to you and they're not how you look like. All of a sudden you're a little bit uncomfortable. What about when you walked in those doors for the very first time and you saw these tables here? (gasps) Is your focus on Jesus then? During my seven months here at Valley, I've had plenty of conversations with a bunch of different people about the order of service, about whether we should have tables or just chairs, about how we do communion, about how we take the offering and many other aspects of our worship service. As an outreach pastor, my job is to take the message inside this building outside these walls and then take people outside these walls and bring them in this building. So, we have one shot to make a first impression. So we want this place to look as welcoming as possible. You know, when people come in here, they're making a decision within the first 15 seconds whether or not they're going to be back. So we want to do our best to make it as welcome as possible. But here's the thing, and I want everybody to hear me loud and clear on this. Comfort is secondary. We could have 120 Lazy Boy chairs out here with mini fridges right next to each one stocked with snacks and drinks. But if we are not preaching the word of Jesus, we are failing as a church. We could have a 15-person professional worship band, complete with a horn section, lasers, and a smoke machine, all ready for our worship songs. But if we are not singing our praises to Jesus, we are failing as a church. We could have a bunch of new people stroll through those doors and sit down and enjoy the worship service. But if they are not seeing how our lives are changed because of what Jesus has done in our life, we should not have the word church on our sign. Our number one job as a Christian church is to spread the good news of the gospel, to make disciples, and to baptize people. That is our number one job as a church. And if that ever stops happening, we go from being Valley Christian Church to Valley Jesus Fan Club. Today we're going to be talking about Jesus coming to a place that they should have been worshiping, but let's just jump into it. Today we're going to be continuing our series on John chapter 2, or I'm sorry, in John, we're going to be in chapter 2 today, about how to reflect Christ. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open them up to John chapter 2. If you don't have your Bibles with you, there's some on the rack back there. Please feel free to get up and get those. If you don't have a Bible and you would like one, please see me, Doug, Mike, or one of the elders. We will make sure you leave here with a Bible. I saw a big box of them in the ark. I don't know if they're to give out, but we're going to give them out. So go ahead and start in 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 John chapter 2. We're going to be starting in verse 13. It says... When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So to understand what's going on here, we need to understand a little bit about Jewish culture and Jewish beliefs. So in case you don't know, back in Exodus... God is talking to Moses, and he tells Moses, this is what I want you to tell your people. I want you to tell them to, every family is supposed to slaughter a lamb, and you're supposed to take some of that blood from the lamb, and you're supposed to paint it over your door frame. And then God says in Exodus 12, he says, On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. This is the festival that Jesus is going to. 
Passover is a huge deal in this culture. If you're going to worship, and everybody should worship, but if you're going to worship, you should definitely go to the temple on Passover. So that explains why Jesus was going to the temple. Now we need to kind of understand why the temple looked like a petting zoo. So, again, part of Jewish culture is when you came to worship, you needed to have a sacrifice. And, you know, it could be a cow, a sheep, or, you know, based on whatever you were sacrificing for. A lot of these people were coming from a long ways away. And bringing a cow from many miles away, that just, you couldn't do it. You couldn't just throw it in your trailer and pull it with your pickup. That didn't happen. So somebody came up with the idea, well, we're just going to sell animals at the temple. That way people don't have to bring their own sacrifices. They can just buy our sacrifices from here. It'll be so much easier. And of course, people were coming from a long way away. So maybe their currency didn't match what was taken at the temple, so they need to have people exchanging money. So these people were, they thought they were helping out. They thought they were helping people to be able to worship. Now here's where the issue comes. They weren't doing this big business at the temple. They weren't doing that out in the church parking lot. They weren't doing it in the yard outside the church. These people were selling animals inside the temple. In a place specifically made for worship, these people were selling animals and exchanging money. And that is why Jesus reacts the way he did. And we can see that reaction starting in verse 15. It says, so he made a whip of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? What? Jesus did that? The prince of peace? The guy who literally said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's the guy that's whipping people and turning over tables? What? Yeah, that was Jesus. And I'll tell you why. Because everything that Jesus did or said was to point people towards God. And when people were taking the focus away from God in a temple made to worship God, that went against Jesus' mission. Now keep in mind, these people were not intentionally causing a problem. They thought they were helping people. They thought, hey, if I can help people worship, I, I must be a, like a, a God superstar. But even with the best of intentions, they were putting other things in front of God in a building specifically made to worship God. What would it look like if every time you walk through those doors... The only thought in your mind was Jesus. What if you weren't thinking about, okay, this is what I have to get done tonight before I go to work or school tomorrow, and I got to get all this stuff done this week, but rather you were thinking about everything that God has done for you up until now? What if when we were singing songs, we were focused on the words that we were singing instead of, really don't care for that song. Not my jam. <laughs> what if instead of worrying about where the tables and chairs are set up, we, we were like Moses who literally heard God say, take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. What if Jesus was the reason for everything that we do here? Would that change the way that we do church? Tell you what, let's get back to that in a little bit. We're going to get back to our passage. So Jesus is whipping and yelling at people, and he's throwing furniture, and he's getting people's attention, as you can imagine. And some of the temple leaders come to him in verse 18, and they say, uh, the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? In other words, hey, check it out, dude. You are making a huge mess of our big business here. And if you're going to do that, you should be somebody pretty important because otherwise we're going to take care of you. 
So what can you show us that shows that you're a, a up and up an important guy? And Jesus responds, he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. So not only are the leaders questioning Jesus, now they just see him as a crazy person because they respond, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? Imagine being one of the disciples that's standing with Jesus while all this is happening. You've just seen Jesus turn water into wine, and that's pretty cool. But now he's talking about rebuilding a whole building in three days. Um, Jesus, you you sure about this? I, mm, I don't know about that. I heard a story about this guy golfing just by himself. Went out, just kind of relax, and he's about ready to start his round. And a guy walks up the, the pathway to the first hole, and he's also playing by himself. Asks if he can join him, and they can play together. The man agrees, and they go about their round. Everything's going well. They're telling, telling each other about themselves, introducing themselves. And throughout the round, it comes out that the second man that came up, he is a king of a small Mediterranean, Mediterranean nation. And the first guy is like, really? I don't see any bodyguards. I don't see a crown. Are you sure you're a king? And he assures him, yes, he's here on vacation. He's just studying the American culture. Yes, he is a king. So they finish their round. Everything is going really well. They're both having a fantastic time. And the king says to the other guy, he says, I have had a fantastic time. I would really like to thank you in some way. Can I give you a gift? What would you like? And the regular guy, he says, no, there's no need. I had a great time. Don't worry about it. And the king insists, I would really like to get you a gift. I'm going to send you something, so might as well tell me what you want. And so the regular man says, well, I, I collect golf clubs. I've got some, some uh, older golf clubs. I've got some newer golf clubs. I've even got one that was, that was actually used by by a really famous golfer. And so, I mean, if you insist on sending me something, send me a golf club. The king says, okay, sure, we can do that. They exchange information. They go about the way. A week later, the regular guy is checking his mail and he sees an envelope and the return address is from a Mediterranean country. He's thinking, Maybe this will tell me where I can go pick up my golf club. Because obviously, I mean, this is just an envelope. How, how can I find a golf club? And so he opens the envelope. And he finds the deed to an 18-hole resort golf club. <laughs> you see, kings think differently than we do. Kings think bigger picture. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing here. As we get back to our verse, it says in Verse 21, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. For the first time, Jesus is talking about why he came here. And that why is extremely important. Anytime you're going to do something, you need to figure out why you're going to do it. I heard a great quote that says, if your why is wrong, the how really doesn't matter. At the start of the year, I set out a goal. I was going to get healthier, drop some weight, but I needed to figure out why I was going to do that. Before I figured out how, I was going to figure out why. And then I figured the why is because of my wife. I want to spend as much time as possible with that woman. The why is because of my daughter that someday I would really like to walk down the aisle. So I need to get healthier to live longer, to be with them. After I figured out why, then I could start figuring out how. And now that the newness has started to wear off, I can look at my, at my why for inspiration. I can keep going forward towards a healthier me. When Jesus turned water into wine, that was a really cool miracle. And it helped out some people. And he was showing, yes, he has the powers to do that. And in a few weeks, 
in the book of John. We're going to be talking about when Jesus specifically laid out his why. For God so loved the world, then is how that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. In our passage today, for the very first time, Jesus talks about the why. And he's also showing people that are coming to worship in the temple some things that we're going to change. This business of needing a sacrifice to come to worship, that all needs to go away because I will be sacrificed for you, and I am more than enough for anybody coming to worship. This business of going to the temple to worship, Jesus would, Jesus would say, I am the temple, come and follow me. Everything Jesus did started with the why, which leads me back to the question before. What would it look like if Jesus was the reason for everything we did here? What would it look like if Jesus was our why? Would it be discussions on where the chairs and the tables get set up? I don't think so. I think it would look like people showing up to show love and compassion, even if it makes them uncomfortable. I think it would look like leaders that preached the gospel in every message that they gave. I think it would look like people continuing to take the next steps in their journey and in their walk towards Christ. It would look like people coming to pray, not just for themselves, but everywhere in the community and also around the world. In other words, it would look like right here, where Jesus is always our why. And if that ever stops, it will never stop, because we're not a Jesus fan club. We are Valley Christian Church. Amen. Let's pray.